So I'm going to welcome everybody now to this uh, session by the National Political Education Committee, NPEC. And we'll let people continue to, to sign in over the next couple of minutes. Um, I'm Bill Barkley. I'm a member of NPEC. I'm also in Ventura County, California, DSA. Now, NPEC has done a series of, of educational events. <laughs> we did one on fighting the ultra-right earlier this year. We did one on imperialism more recently. We have one coming up on the Middle East in sometime in December. But today we're going to talk about reconstruction. And we have two really knowledgeable speakers with us today, Dr. Manisha Sinha and Dr. Gerald Horn, who I'll introduce each in a little more detail when they get ready to talk. And um, they were going to, I think, give us a very interesting discussion. So those of you who are signing in, you can submit questions and there will be a Q&A then. So the format will be something like this. I'll have a couple of minutes of introduction. Then uh, uh, Professor Senha will go first, uh, then Professor, followed by Professor Horn. I'll give them a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to Q&A for the rest of the session. So as you hear the two panelists talk, um, please, if a question comes to your mind, use the uh, Q&A panel to send it in and it, uh, address it if possible to one of the other panelists, unless you really want them both to respond to it. And then we'll, on the Q&A, we'll go with it. Now, I want to bring this, being in this with a personal note. I was one of the first people to push to have this session. So I grew up as a white Southerner in Raleigh, North Carolina in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, we did learn a little about Reconstruction. And the one I remember, thing I remember the most is our teacher took us down to the Capitol in Raleigh. And on the tour of the Capitol, there were marble steps inside the Capitol. If you've ever seen marble steps, you know how they wear. They wear with the dentation in the middle. When we got part way down the steps, our teacher turned to us and said, do you see those indentations? We all nodded, being good eighth graders. And she said, those were made by African-American legislators. She used a different term. African-American legislators, when they rolled whiskey barrels up and down the steps during Reconstruction. So that is one picture of Reconstruction. We're going to learn something very different about Reconstruction today. And I hope if you had a chance to read the two articles suggested by Professor Sinha and Professor Horn, you've already got some idea what the difference is. But I, I say that also because Professor Horn, this really reminds you of what W. B. Boys was, was fighting when he wrote his the very the excellent book of uh, Black Reconstruction that you reviewed and that thing we sent out. All right, so um, we'll start with um, Dr. Dr. Sinha. She is a she's a Howard the Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut. Now she has a lot of books and articles, and I'm not going to read them all. But I'm looking forward to the next one, which is called "The Rise and Fall of the Second American Republic: Reconstruction from 1860 to 1920s." And I think it's very important that she's extended this framework beyond 1860 to 1876. And she was also a guest of the Daily Show, um, which is probably really interesting. Uh, you may have noticed that one of the articles we suggested reading was her, her the case for a third reconstruction, which she put out, I think it was in 1921. So with no further ado, Dr. Sinha, it's over to you. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Um, you know, I used to attend the DSA uh, conferences at the Manhattan Borough Community College way back when, when I was a graduate student, uh, religiously, every year. And now uh, I'm just happy to um, to be part of this program. And it's a bit of an honor to be here with Gerald Horn. You talked about how many books I've written. Well, I wouldn't start reading out all the titles of Gerald Horn's books because uh, that would pretty much take up all the time we have today. So it's a real honor to be here with you, Gerald. So um, I'll, I'll get started with talking about uh, my new book on, on Reconstruction and how I am reframing our understanding of Reconstruction a little bit uh, with that book. And I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, okay, it doesn't seem, it says I am disabled from screen sharing. I thought that, okay, I am. Okay, good. Now I, I can. So I will um, share my screen with you. Um, so that um, you're not too bored um, as I go through this presentation and you have a sense 
uh, what I'm talking about. So one of the ways in which I am reframing our understanding of reconstruction in this new book is um, to pay a lot of attention to the fall of, of reconstruction. Normally when historians look at reconstruction, they kind of end with 1877, the so-called compromise of 1877 that put Rutherford B. Hayes in the presidency and then led to the fall of the last reconstruction state governments in the South, in Florida, in Louisiana and South Carolina through a combination of racist terror um, and um, voter suppression, uh, mainly of course of, of African-American voters. Um, and also Southern white unionists. Um, so I am going to talk about the period after 1877. Uh, that is a period that uh, most historians do not include uh, in histories of reconstruction. And I argue that if we look at the fall of what I call a second American Republic, uh, which was you know, roughly uh, inaugurated with the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 and ends around 1900. Um, during this time, this time between 1877 and 1890, we can really see the unwinding of Reconstruction um, in, in much greater depth and link it to the conquest of the West, hence the scenic view that you have in the first slide. Um, the dispossession of Western Indians, uh, and through that, of course, uh, the rise of imperialism and formal American empire, which went beyond settler colonialism uh, for the United States to join the, the scramble for empire at the turn of the century. So this is uh, what I'm doing this book, is I am reframing our understanding of Reconstruction by looking at the long unwinding of Reconstruction. Um, and I think it's a good thing to begin with a quote from Abraham Lincoln here, uh, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. Uh, and he's of course talking about slavery and its long afterlives. Uh, I'm going to just deploy that quote to talk about reconstruction, its overthrow and the long afterlives uh, of that fall uh, of reconstruction. So let me just briefly introduce the book broadly so you understand uh, what I'm trying to do. Um, and then I'll talk about the simultaneous fall of reconstruction and the rise of American empire. So the crucial question of reconstruction, of course, is this, how did interracial democracy progress under the revolutionary impetus of the civil war and emancipation? And why did that effort unravel by the end of the 19th century? Reconstruction birthed a national citizenship, expanding the boundaries of political belonging, rights, and claims on the nation state. Building, quote, a composite nation, as the self-emancipated abolitionist Frederick Douglass argued, was the greatest challenge of the Second American Republic. It was a fraught and contested project. Nearly 750,000 Americans, of course, died in the Civil War. Uh, many more 100,000 indigenous people were killed uh, in wars, on reservations, and assimilation campaigns uh, in the second half of the 19th century. But around 4 million enslaved people won their freedom and citizenship rights only to be subject to a new regime of racist terror after the fall of Reconstruction. Despite the emergence of a women's suffrage movement, uh, women remained disfranchised, Asian immigrants were systematically excluded, and strikes by workers of all ethnic ethnicities violently put down by what one historian has recently called capitals terrorists. Now, within this larger frame, my book focuses on the debate on who is a citizen and what is the role of the state in expanding or constricting rights and indigenous sovereignty. Its primary theme is the ongoing tension between democracy and capitalism, with the latter's historical entanglement in slavery and imperialism. Now, after the industrial takeoff of the United States that occurred exactly in this period of the fall of Reconstruction between 1877 to the end of the 19th century. The reconstruction of capitalism proved to be successful, even as the reconstruction of democracy faltered. 
Now, democracy in the United States has always been rigorously challenged by forces of political and economic reaction. The rapid industrialization of the country and the dismal conditions of labor that followed Reconstruction made a mockery of the free labor ideology of the victorious North. New wars and imperial dreams of empire inspired by the regime of racial apartheid in the post-war South and the conquest of Western Indian nations further hobbled American democracy at home and abroad. By the end of the 19th century, a formal US empire would subject people from the Caribbean to the Philippines to colonial rule. The demise of the Second American Republic inaugurated an era of hierarchy and inequality, racial, ethnic, gendered, and economic, rather than the one of for equal citizenship promised by emancipation and reconstruction. Now, connecting the struggle for Black citizenship with debates over ethnicity, gender, economic autonomy, and sovereignty that ranged at the same time, I aim to show that we have missed much by confining our vision of the end of Reconstruction to the South, meaning we need to talk about the unwinding of Reconstruction in a national, in fact, in a global context. So it is not only the chronology and scope of my new book, but, it, but its interpretation that is at odds with conventional narratives, which have emphasized how the United States was able to develop a long and unique, um, long lasting experiment in Republican government by expanding democracy incrementally, but consistently to groups previously denied inclusion. In the prevailing view, the Anglo-American tradition of liberal democracy is distinct from the more volatile histories of continental Europe, or so the story goes from simplistic stories of American exceptionalism to more sophisticated analyses of democracy in the Western world, the old consensus cannot in fact explain the violent upheavals of the mid to late 19th century United States. Now the civil war resulted in the destruction of what I call the first American Republic, what many historians have called the slaveholding Republic because slaveholders so dominated the government of the United States until the very eve of the Civil War uh, and birthed the second. My notion of a second republic comes from the history of French republicanism. In borrowing that terminology to describe events in the United States, I seek to highlight the growth of reactionary authoritarianism in the post-war South, a type of politics that we often associate only with continental Europe or the rest of the Americas. Put simply, the long afterlives of slavery and imperialism are as important to understanding US history as are more familiar ameliorative tales about the abolition of slavery and the expansion of democracy and citizenship rights during reconstruction, which of course also did take place. The story of the contest between the two is designed to capture an essential and ongoing theme in the United States, which is never one and all the other. I must emphasize that. Um, we tend to turn 180 degrees in terms of understanding US history, uh, when in fact the reality, the historical reality is always far more complex and far more nuanced. Uh, and I think both as citizens and activists, we need to understand that. Now, not only that, but the history of the unmaking of Reconstruction reveals the global significance of the first abortive attempt to transform the slaveholders' republic into an interracial democracy. My goal then is to put Reconstruction in a broad international context and to thereby demonstrate that its long death had as much to tell us or has as much to tell us as its short-lived triumph after the Civil War. Now, the Second American Republic, born during the Civil War, was a massive course correction. Course correction from the history of settler colonialism, from the histories of slavery and the slaveholding republic, or what was known then as, quote, the slave power resulting in the destruction of racial slavery and the enactment of national citizenship, regardless of color and previous condition of servitude. Its fall rather than success 
paved the way for the triumph of a global US empire and revived the specifically Southern dream of an imperium built on and intended to perpetuate racial subordination. Now, um, this is a point again that I want to make carefully because there have been historians on the left who have argued that emancipation and abolition led to empire. I am saying no, it was actually the defeat of that emancipatory project that led to imperialism. And here I think I'm in, in sync with Gerald Horn, who in his wonderful book, The White Pacific, uh, shows us how this Southern neo-Confederate dream of perpetuating slavery, uh, perpetuating extraction of surpluses and finding new markets for capitalism um, is something that continues uh, after the Civil War and continues specifically uh, into the Pacific, into the West uh, with the rise of empire. So reconstruction and its long afterlives in the United States, not emancipation, propelled the drive for an overseas empire, whether in the form of formal annexations and colonization or more informally through foreign interventions to serve US strategic and economic interests. A racist thermidor resulted in the unwinding of Reconstruction, which involved not just the subjugation of African-Americans and Western Indian nations, but also the exclusion of Asian immigrants. The rise of Jim Crow in the South and other internal regimes of racist hierarchy fed into the logic and momentum of US imperialism. These domestic developments were in fact the preconditions for the rise of an overseas American empire. Now the 1890s proved to be a crucial de decade when all these events played out and when the second American Republic finally crumbled with the establishment of US hegemony in the Caribbean and the Pacific. So I'm, I'm saying that, you know, 1877 historians debate, was there really a compromise or not? Whether there was a formal compromise or not, we do know that it did result in the election of Hayes, and it did result in the fall of the Southern, the last Southern Reconstruction state governments. But we cannot end just with 1877 when we are looking at the fall of Reconstruction. We do need to look at what happens after that. Uh, and you can see this sort of growing reaction um, to this project of an interracial democracy is not just limited in the South. Uh, through, as I said, campaigns of racist terror and voter suppression, but their attempts to exclude the Chinese. Uh, you finally have a Chinese exclusion law that is passed in 1882. You have formal disfranchisement of African-American men uh, in uh, the South uh, with the so-called Mississippi Plan of 1890, which in its state constitution um, disfranchises, formally disfranchises all black men. Um, you have, of course, the Wounded Knee Massacre of uh, the Lakota, which is often seen as uh, the, the sort of end of the conquest of the West. People called it the closing of the frontier, but it is really the subjugation of, of all Western Indian nations. You have the inauguration of Jim Crow. Uh, with the Supreme Court giving its blessings in Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. Even before that, the Supreme Court had a history of overturning or um, a whittling down uh, reconstruction amendments and federal civil rights laws um, so that they could either be misused to protect the rights of corporations or uh, they could completely be um, uh, sort of dead letters. Uh, in, in US law. Uh, given what the Supreme Court is doing now, you can see there's a real precedent uh, to what they did uh, in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, um, ending with the infamous Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, this is also the time that I think it's really important to understand that the end of the 1890s really marks a, a turn towards empire. Beginning with the Spanish-Cuban-American War, um, and ending with um, the United States sort of annexing Hawaii, um, also uh, the pacification quote of Philippines, which they got uh, from Spain. Um, you know, this is really the time when empire kicks off in a big way, even though the US of course had 
uh, acquired territories before this time period. Um, and I use the Wilmington Massacre in North Carolina, Bill's home state, in 1898 as a good example of this because as late as the 1890s, there was still a possibility for Black Republicans, meaning African Americans in the Republican Party and other progressive, including the populist movement, the movement of farmers um, to, to sort of tame down capitalism, tame down the railroads and other monopolies um, that gave them the short end of the stick. Um, they had developed programs, cooperatives, they had developed alliances with the Knights of Labor and other with suffragists, with all progressive forces. And, and these alliances came into being in, in North Carolina, in Tennessee, in uh, Virginia, and they are finally overthrown only in the 1890s. So this is an important part of one of the legacies of Reconstruction that we normally don't look at because we just end at 1877. Uh, the Wilmington Massacre, and you can see a picture here of these uh, vigilante racist uh, terror groups um, that burned down um, uh, uh, the, the newspaper offices of, uh, of uh, African-Americans in Wilmington who were a relatively prosperous uh, and politically um, um, sort of assertive community. Um, they uh, actually had a white Republican mayor and many African Americans as office holders. Uh, this was a sheer coup, a massacre, um, where they overthrew the city's uh, government after overthrowing the state government, um, the, the fusion government between Republicans and populists in North Carolina. Um, and what's interesting is that many of these men that you see pictured here were actually part of the Wilmington Light Infantry that had taken part in the Spanish-Cuban-American War. So you can see how these two projects uh, intersect, uh, the projects of the overthrow of interracial democracy within the United States and the acquisition of empire uh, in Cuba outside the United, the United States. Uh, so even before the Civil War, pro-slavery imperialism had played no small part uh, in the emergence of an anti-slavery free soil Republican Party. It was not just a question of the expansion of slavery into the Western territories, which were really indigenous territories, um, but there were these uh, pro-slavery democratic um, governments that had already started acquiring territory outside the United States. Um, the Guano Islands Act, which made uh, you know, its way to um, the 1867 Act, which led to the annexation of the, these islands. They had guano, which is a um, very valuable fertilizer in agriculture. They also acquired in 1867 the Midway Islands, and of course, they got Alaska Seward's Folly. Uh, William Seward is an interesting character. He is was thought to be an anti-slavery radical, but he was extremely conservative during the secession crisis and the Civil War, eventually came to even defend Andrew Jans Johnson and was a bit of an imperialist, was always looking out to the Pacific and looking out to the islands as uh, a realm to expand um, American empire. So it kind of began slowly with these acquisitions. Um, and this was their recipe for capitalist imperialism um, because there were many um, business interests uh, along with pro-slavery imperialists who hoped to make a windfall from guano. Um, the, this was a sponsorship of corporate interests by government despite a formal commitment to laissez-faire when it came to economic regulation and the interests of labor. Um, all this was born in the hunt for guano. Um, so they also um, uh, enslaved many times local non-white populations uh, in labor conditions uh, very close to slavery, and they begin this kind of experiment with um, enslaving labor and, and kind of spreading uh, American Imperium in, in Guano. But this was not something that would um, <clears throat> be necessarily the part to empire. We see a bit of a break during the Civil War and its aftermath, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to the rise of empire. You can see how anti-slavery forces, democratic forces are also contesting this. Lincoln from the start 
is very supportive of anti-slavery republics that are formed like the Argentinian Republic. Um, they are certainly giving a lot of moral support to the Mexican Republic when they are um, annexed or when the um, uh, the French put uh, Maximilian, the Emperor Maximilian, uh, and conquer Mexico. The sympathies are with the with Benito Juarez and his liberal Republicans to overthrow Spanish rule. Uh, when the Spanish acquire the Dominican Republic, again the sympathy is there um, with uh, the Dominican Republic, uh, and eventually, of course, in in both these places, they managed to overthrow European imperialism with quote American moral support. Unfortunately, uh, very soon after this, Grant actually has a plan to annex the Dominican Republic, uh, which is supported, unfortunately, by people like Frederick Douglass, but many old abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison and radicals like Charles Sumner oppose Grant's plan to annex Dominic the Dominican Republic, and he fails to do that. So, but from, during the Civil War and immediately after that, you can see how the sympathies are really with anti-slavery democratic forces um, during the period of Reconstruction. Um, you know, the year that Lincoln issues his Emancipation Proclamation, the Dutch have their own emancipation, but it's a uh, it's modeled after the British uh, emancipation with a long period of apprenticeship, um, which is which is finally done away with. Um, but uh, laws in Cuba, in Puerto Rico, in Brazil, all moving more towards anti-slavery that is encouraged by by Lincoln. And there is a subaltern connection here too. Uh, many Afro-Brazilians and Afro-Cubans are looking to the United States and at the experiment of reconstruction to fight for black rights also. Um, one of the Cuban generals, the famous Afro-Cuban general, uh, Antonio Maceo Grijales was very popular amongst uh, black freed populations in the South. Uh, many black freed people even named their children Maceo after this Afro-Cuban general. So there is a, a sense of international solidarity, at least, uh, amongst um, uh, African descended peoples and also uh, amongst anti-slavery Republicans who are hoping to use the U.S. example to push towards emancipation in the last slave societies in the Western Hemisphere, uh, especially Cuba and Brazil, which were which were very big um, slave societies. Um, now we know, of course, that this was not successful. Ultimately, um, you know, you have uh, the counter revolution, as Gerald calls it rightly, uh, winning over. Right, you have um, Southern Confederates going to Brazil, American corporations going to Cuba, warning of the disruptions to plantation economy and the imperils uh, uh, and the peril of interracial democracy that they had witnessed in the Reconstruction South. You have Capital's revived alliance uh, with provincial reactionary planter merchant elites throughout the Americas, um, and this really signifies a loss of this promise of emancipation, uh, how elites really defeated freed people's access to the ballot, but even control over their labor and to land, uh, especially. Though there were many formative plans uh, for land reform uh, immediately after the Civil War that I talk about in the book, but because of lack of time, I'm not gonna be able to get into right now. Um, so um, what we see instead, of course, is that, um, with this loss of um, the, of, uh, no, I think I went back to the previous, I want to go here, um, slide, um, that many people saw the inter what they saw as the international significance of the fall of the Second American Republic or Reconstruction. And it was a lesson that Western imperialists drew from the United States about the necessity of ordering, quote, the relations between ruling and subject races and the notion of the unfitness of non-white races for political rights. Pronouncing reconstruction in the South as a failure and the conquest of the West as a success, the US joined the European nations in the scramble for empire. 
So uh, most Americans, as the historian Nina Silva observes, quote, internationalize the race problem, identifying the, quote, common backward characteristics of all non-white peoples, as well as a common superiority of Anglo-Saxons around the world. Um, in fact, the alleged failure of Reconstruction became the specific grounds on which American intellectuals and politicians justified not only despotic rule at home, but an overseas empire. Jim Crow on a global scale. This is John W. Burgess on the left, a Southerner and Columbia University political scientist who vilified black citizenship as, quote, a monstrous thing. And he commended the now imperialist Republican Party for taking on, quote, the white man's burden of civilizing the world and for imposing the sovereignty of the United States upon eight millions of Asiatics in the Philippines after the Spanish-Cuban-American War of 1898. Now, in founding an overseas empire, the administration of William McKinley had steered the Republican Party, and this is all Burgess, who wrote one of the first histories of Reconstruction, say, from the supposedly false notions of racial equality to an understanding, quote, of the vast differences of the political capacity between the races. Now, Burgess's colleague Dunning, William Dunning at Columbia, who began this mostly uh, Southern school of uh, uh, Dunning School of Re Reconstruction Historiography. Um, they were the first professionally trained historians to write about Reconstruction, and they perpetuated lost cause myths, racist stereotypes, um, and basically gave scholarly legitimacy to, um, the, to the Jim Crow South. So it's important to, to remember that. Okay, I, I can see I'm running out of my time, so I'm going to conclude very soon. Um, I, I conclude with Charles Francis Adams Jr. commending that the race problem in the United States, which was taking on, quote, less of a theoretical and humanitarian approach, which is what the abolitionists had, was now embracing the reigning shibboleths of the pseudoscience of race. Uh, and in this view, of course, the pro-slavery Confederates had been right all along. Uh, now, I could go into further details about um, the, you know, um, the rise of empire. I cannot. Uh, so I will end with this. Um, I would talk. I would have talked in greater depth about the acquisition of Hawaii, um, where Queen Lilia Kalani draws a straight line between the conquest of the West to the annexation of Hawaii, um, and to the anti-imperialist league that opposed this, uh, but also to the insular cases um, that, um, on the one hand, in the Wong Kim Ark case. Um, uh, recognize that um, birthright, national birthright citizenship guaranteed by the 14th Amendment, one of the re the most important Reconstruction constitutional amendment, was applicable to Wong Kim Ark. Uh, on the other hand, in the insular cases, they developed a constitution for empire where they said, once we acquire empires or colonial territories, territory, insular territories, mainly island, that's why insular, um, that these uh, populations would lie outside the protections of the U.S. Constitution and outside the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection under the law and national birthright citizenship. Until today, territories like Puerto Rico, uh, Guam, Samoa, they're still in that relationship with the United States, even though Hawaii and Alaska have been annexed uh, as states into the United States. So... Uh, this is the long legacy of Reconstruction um, and the fall of Reconstruction, which is one of them is, in fact, imperialism um, and uh, limiting the rights of people and, and remaining in a somewhat of a colonial relationship uh, with, with large groups of people that we normally don't think of uh, when we think of the U.S. today. So I, I will stop right there. Thank you very much, Dr. Sam. That was brilliant. Um, I just want to add that I studied California agriculture and some of the ex-Confederate slaveholders came out after the Civil War and set up a system not completely dissimilar to what they had in the South, in places yes, like the Valley. Yeah. The fact that they passed a law in 1867 saying that um, peonage it comes under the 13th Amendment, therefore, is unconstitutional. 
um, you had the persistence of Indian servitude and peonage. I mean, California was notorious. There's a new book on this called California, a slave state, because so many Southerners tried to introduce these regimes of, you know, unfree labor and servitude there. And California had so had the distinction of being the only free state that did not pass the 14th and the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So, yeah. on, that note, <laughs> on that note, thank you again very much. And, and by the way, let me remind the audience, uh, for questions, please put them in the uh, Q&A because we will take the questions to, for both of our panelists later. But right now we're going to turn to uh, Professor Gerald Horn. Uh, Dr. Horn is holds the chair of John Jay and Rebecca Moore Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He has also a lot of books, but one of the things that really struck me, Dr. Horn, is you received the Frantz Fanon Lifetime Achievement Award from the Caribbean Philosophers Association. And as somebody who grew up reading Fanon when I actually realized that my education in the South was lacking, that was very interesting to me. But beyond that, Dr. Horn is actually has, you, you were the uh, legal counsel for the Hospital Workers Union in New York City. So you're both an academic, but you've been an activist as well. And now I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, to be our second panelist. And again, remind people that if you've got questions for either panelist, please put them into the Q&A and we will get to them at the end of the more formal presentations. Dr. Horn. First of all, thank you to DSA for inviting me. Uh, secondly, it's an honor to be sharing a platform with Professor Senna. I think that our talks are complementary. Just as she goes forward, I'll be going back to the origins of settler colonialism. And I should also say that uh, as a professor who hasn't been in the classroom for a while, my talk will be bibliographic to a degree as I cite the work of other historians who I think have not received sufficient attention, particularly to the detriment of the activist community. Let me begin by saying that if I that I sit on the unceded land in what is called Southeast Texas of the heroic Comanche, the Kiowa, the Shawnee, and especially the Caro, who had an interlocking directorate with black folk. This is not just a pro forma statement since part of my thesis is that today, we not only desperately need a rewriting of the history of reconstruction as Professor Sinna is doing, we also need a rewriting of the entire corpus on settler colonialism in North America, a term that strangely is often applied to historic Palestine by some of the same folk who rarely invoke it with regard to North America. In fact, I argue today that in order to understand Reconstruction and its failure, or its failure to live up to its promise, one must understand the indigenous question, settler colonialism, and the class collaboration that undergirds it, which of course involves a radical retelling of US history in motion by historians, but ignored by all too many, who oftentimes are like biology teachers today who act as if DNA was never uncovered. And of course, this retelling should also involve seeing class, slavery as the ultimate class question and plotting its downfall by reference to the international situation. Indeed, I would argue further that the failure to engage the notion of settler colonialism not only hampers the ability to understand reconstruction, but the failure most notably to theorize this bedrock concept hampers the ability to understand the possibility of World War III being triggered in historic Palestine, not to mention the simultaneous troubling developments of a Nazi receiving a standing ovation in Canada's parliament, the ignominious setback to indigenous rights recently in Australia, the victory in New Zealand of a right-wing party, not to mention the possibility of fascism arriving on these shores. I dare say that if some had spent less time seeking to apply the, an artful concept of, quote, identity politics, unquote, to black formations and more time perhaps applying it to a polity whose basis for rights turned upon an exclusive, exclusivist religious or ethno-religious identity, we all would be better off and more advantageously positioned to confront the possibility of World War III. Uh, thus, in my remarks today, as in my piece in The Nation, I think the problem for the uh, concept of recent reconstruction, roughly 1865 forward, is the failure in grappling with both the indigenous question and the class question. With regard to the former, fortunately scholars have been making headway, I think of the work of Ned Blackhawk of Yale and his rediscovery of America, the work of Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, the work of Kyle T. Mays, whose work speaks to a road not taken on these shores, both historiographically and politically. 
as insofar as it points not necessarily to the triumph of European settlers in North America, but a more diverse victory of the indigenous and black folk tied to a major external power. As my opening land acknowledgement suggests, such an acknowledgement, and by the way, are much more common in Australia than in this nation, I think because of the overestimation of the progressiveness of 1776, it would be as if West Bank settlers revolted, declared an independent entity, and the credulous subsequently would hail this as a great leap forward for humanity simply because they accorded a full complement of rights and benefits to settlers, but expelled or liquidated others. In other words, a new history of both reconstruction in this nation should begin with a less credulous viewpoint. Uh, since Black Hawk has just won the National Black, uh, Book Award, all too many, once again, can tell after the US elite and pay more attention to his work, which has the virtue of stressing land, seizing same from indigenous as a driver of 1776, with London reluctant to expend blood and treasure so that real estate speculators such as George Washington can profit, and the pressure from the bottom for land too, such as the depredations of the Paxton boys of Pennsylvania, whose anti-indigenous psychosis was part of their identity politics and generally that of the settlers writ large. For the sake of brevity, a new history could begin with why it is that England triumphed over Spain on these shores beginning in the 16th century, which has quite a bit to do with the Catholic versus Protestant conflict with the latter as scrappy underdogs, which led to a historic compromise with the Jewish diaspora after England had expelled its own Jewish population at the end of the 13th century, which among other things contributed uh, to the weakening of Spain, this historic compromise, since Spain per the Inquisition offered the Jewish community the choice of converting or facing liquidation or torture. Then fast forward from 1588 to 1688 to William Pettigrew's freedom's debt, which lays a foundation for understanding of expansion of the African slave trade imbricated in the rise of capitalism, the clipping of the wings of the monarch, and the rise of rebelliousness in the colonies in the New World. That in turn leads to Spain seeking to turn the tables on London by spurring revolts of the enslaved, such as in South Carolina in 1739, with, London, with Stono's revolt sparked in part by Africans in military uniforms of Madrid, which in turn leads to the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 63, and the attempt to all Spain, out Spain from Florida and Cuba, and France from Canada. France supposedly had a role from Quebec in stirring up the Negroes in Manhattan in 1712 and 1741. However, as is well known, London, by the event of the Royal Proclamation of 1763, per Blackhawk, wants to restrain the settlers from expanding westward, causing the crown to expend blood and treasure, not to mention the growing controversy over enslavement of Africans as represented in the work of Robert Parkinson, which leads to 1776. Again, per Parkinson, our scholars have not been missing in action altogether. Speaking of Woody Holton of South Carolina, the late Berkeley historian Tyler Stovall in his book, White Freedom. I would also include scholars of the indigenous, such as Benjamin Matley of UCLA, the paramount black intellectual Ishmael Reed and his spoof of the Disney extravaganza of Lynn manuel Miranda, speaking of Hamilton, the Haitian filmmaker Raul Peck, and his film, Exterminate All the Brutes, even the work of Nicole Hannah-Jones and her 1619 project, which has stirred countless state legislatures into action in the battles against so-called critical race theory and so-called wokeness, so that little Jennifer and Johnny won't be traumatized by accurate stories of genocide and enslavement. See Florida's Ron DeSantis and Virginia's Glenn Youngkin in particular, the latter who made the novels of Nobel laureate Toni Morrison a campaign issue. I would also point to an article in the current uh, William and Mary Quarterly by Irvine's Alex Baruki. Uh, you can find my interview with him at kpfk.org. Uh, he suggests that US scholars have been much too insular in sketching the alleged abolitionist origins of the enslaving republic, whereas he suggests to understand the United States and slavery in, this, in the late colonial days in the early republic, one has to understand North America's relationship uh, North American settlers' relationship to Spain, still seeking payback against London, which allowed these settlers to gain tremendous resources for the so-called Revolutionary War by trading uh, Africans into Cuba through Cartagena to the Rio de la Plata or Argentina. It is well known that one cannot understand the victory of the settlers without understanding the role of France, 
and likewise backing the settlers, especially at the pivotal Battle of Yorktown, causing Paris to go into debt, heightening the wrenching of their Caribbean sugar producing islands leading to the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, which ignites a general crisis of the entire slave system, which can only be resolved with its collapse, including in North America. In other words, given the profound importance of enslavement to the fortunes of the Republic, we should not be surprised by how and why Reconstruction was not allowed to fulfill its promise. The overestimation of abolitionism in the United States ill prepares us to uncomprehend while how and why Reconstruction did not fulfill this promise. Here again, reference to yet another Yale scholar, speaking of Maureen Dowd, who I interviewed on KPFK just this afternoon, whose latest book invidiously compares 1804 with 1776 to the detriment of the latter, or look at the work of the scholar Harvey Amani Whitfield, who questions the purported abolitionist, abolitionism of Vermont in the 1770s, suggesting that like Oregon in the 1850s, the motivation was no Negroes allowed, be they enslaved or free. And then like a shell game that's interpreted to mean anti-slavery and then <laughs> shoehorn into uh, converting somehow into abolitionism. I sketched this period before reconstruction since we can now, since one cannot understand this latter era without understanding what came before. To his credit, Du Bois in his book does confront the conundrum of why so many Euro-American workers fought to preserve a system enslavement that would drag down their wages, a reality bequeathed to us today, though there is less insight, I'm afraid to say, than Du Bois mustered in the 1930s in figuring out the Trump vote, for example, or why 15, 55% of Euro-Americans voted for a Nazi David Duke to be a governor of Louisiana about three decades ago. Of course, analyzing class collaborationism has not been a strength of the US left, who much prefer to fix the misleading label identity politics on various forms of black self-assertion, even though this is actually the legacy of class solidarity emerging from the unpaid sector of the working class. Frederick Douglass, the preeminent Negro leader then, had a number of li liabilities during this tempestuous era. As Kyle T. Mays points out, he was quite weak on the indigenous question, which led to the major reconstruction anomaly Negroes in East Texas were being butchered by settlers post-1865 as Negro soldiers in West Texas were routing the indigenous. Speaking of the indigenous question, the multi-billion dollar film financed by Apple starring DiCaprio and De Niro does a better job of underlining the class collaboration that undergirds settler colonialism than many of our so-called U.S. radicals do. And of course, class collaboration is key to understanding the Trump phenomenon, right-wing populism, right-wing social democracy, and figures from Andrew Jackson to Albert Shanker to the attempted adaptation by Bayard Rustin. Douglas was also weak in analyzing the global balance of forces and its impact on the United States and the formerly enslaved. Despite his laudable journeys to London pre-war, Douglas hardly paid attention to the transformation of Hawaii driven by the Meiji Restoration in Japan or the retreat of serfdom in Russia, though this country was a more reliable ally to Washington during this time than London. And though he did pay attention to enslavement nearby in Cuba, he and the Black leadership should have promptly launched post-1865 in conjunction with their London ally, an all-out assault, assault on enslavement in Northern and Eastern Africa which persisted well into the 20th century. Uh, such a movement would have favorably impacted the global correlation of forces. And some, a major weakness of the Negro leadership during Reconstruction was the inability to devise a global strategy, which did not materialize until the mature Du Bois arose in the 20th century with his overtures to both Tokyo and Moscow. Uh, this hirsute leader, speaking of Douglas, is emblematic of the leader who performs better in certain epics over others. That is, pre-1865, I salute the fact that he spent considerable time in London, though the former mother country and its revolting offspring were often at dagger's point. For example, during the War of 1812, when the Redcoats torched Washington, D.C., uh, sending President Madison and his garrulous spouse Dolly fleeing into the streets one he step ahead of the posse, with the invaders joined by enslaved Africans who joined in the rout, then flee on British ships for Trinidad and Tobago, where their descendants continued to reside. 
I think of the day that will forever live in infamy, as certain enslavers would argue, December 7th, 1841, when enslaved Africans on the ship Creole revolt off the shores of the Bahamas, steer the ship to this British colony where they are judged to be not commodities, but victims of kidnapping and trafficking, and were freed as black men in red coats lovingly fingered their weapons. In other words, Douglas's consorting with London and consorting with the heroic John Brown, then Douglas fleeing to London, represented sound leadership. I would say the same for the most part of his leadership during the war, though it would have been helpful that by 1863, he had pointed to the issues involved with the Emancipation Proclamation, that is to say the uncompensated expropriation of private property and enslaved Africans, perhaps the largest before the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which predictably unleashed post-war a reign of terror that to a degree continues today against the Africans and their descendants. Douglas apparently was incapable of doing what Du Bois did, that is to say, analyzing the trajectory of the most poisonous form of class collaborationist and militarized identity politics, uh, speaking of the construction of whiteness, whereby those who had been warring in Europe, English versus Irish, English versus Scots, British versus German, German versus Pole, Pole versus Russian, Serb versus Croat, Northern Italian versus Southern Italian, French Huguenots versus French Christians, eventually Christian versus Jewish, the list is seemingly end endless, all of a sudden when they cross the Atlantic are transmuted magically into this new militarized identity politics of whiteness morphing into white supremacy, allowing for a block of settlers to subdue, then liquidate the indigenous, then corral the enslaved Africans. Douglas's failure was not his alone, perhaps because he found himself in a coalition with big capital and because both the paid and unpaid sectors of the working class were relatively weak organizationally, this left him with few options. But fortunately today, we can learn the lesson of reconstruction, which includes acknowledging the legacy of class solidarity that inheres in descendants of the unpaid sector of the working class, passing the PRO Act in Congress, making it easier to organize the wage earning sector of this class, thereby ensuring victories along the lines of SAG-AFTRA, the UAW and the Teamsters, but again, these future victories would be aided immeasurably by adopting a clear-eyed view of the troubled history of this land and moving decisively away from creation myths and wrong-headed accounts of history. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Warren. That was really excellent. Um, and again, I want to remind people that you can send questions in that we will actually ask the panelists to address to the whole group rather than simply by the chat. Um, I'm going to start with just a question to one, one, one question to each of you. So, uh, Dr. Seha, in your article in the Eurofuel Books in 2021, you argue for the need for a third reconstruction and you, um, you outline what some parameters that, that might look like. Um, two years have passed. What do you think about where we are and what might or might not happen? Do we, do we have a chance for a third reconstruction? Um, that's a good question. You know, um, it, it ha we have to have some hope and optimism of the world that um, that that you know that we continue to fight for it. Um, I think the twenty twenty presidential elections. Um, many people saw Joe Biden's victory and the underperformance of the Republican Party, which has gone full blown fascist now uh, in the twenty twenty two midterm elections, um, as as a sign of hope. But the fact is that these people are still around and in a two party system, they continue to pose a great threat to um, to, to, to democracy uh, in this country. Um, some of the most mainstream notions that we can think about leave alone questions on the left. So I, um, I do think we still need a constitutional reckoning. We do need um, a sort of a, a movement that would lead to uh, to many things that that the people in the first reconstruction talked about. There were hundreds of bills proposed in Congress in the first reconstruction, abolishing the electoral college and making the presidential elections, you know, single one person, one vote. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some came close to passing, but unfortunately it did not happen. 
Um, and the, you know, the reason we could pass many of these reconstruction amendments is also because the Southern states were not part of the union. We'd gotten rid of the worst reactionaries in the country in order to do that. Amending the US constitution is a very tall task. So I, I think we need to politically defeat just as the slave South was defeated politically and in the battlefields during the Civil War, we need to defeat reactionary forces in this country to an extent that we can think about a third reconstruction. I mean, if you think of just the, you know, the constitutional amendments, you know, two thirds of Congress, three fourths of uh, the states with our gerrymandered voter suppression political system. It's really difficult, I can imagine, to think about passing many of those laws or uh, even just implementing the Reconstruction Amendment. So let's say we even just implement the 14th Amendment. If you have voter suppression in your state, you you, you lose representation in Congress. Um, if you have led an insurrection against the government of the United States after having sworn an oath of office to the U.S. Constitution, you should not be allowed to contest elections. We just heard today about the case against Donald Trump um, that he should not be allowed to run for elections since he has aided and abetted an insurrection. I would say forget even passing new laws or amendments. Let's just implement uh, the amendments and laws that we have in place. Um, no uh, holding the U.S. government's hostage over the debt ceiling. That's in the 14th Amendment, too. We could actually, I mean, these are all sleeping giants in our constitution, the reconstruction laws and amendments. If we just implemented them, we'd be fine. Of course, we have a reactionary Supreme Court um, that has whittled away the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that continues to whittle away the reconstruction laws and amendments. Um, you know, I think we, Biden should do what FDR did threaten to do, pack the court. Uh, and get it into shape or even implement ethics to get the most corrupt uh, members out of this or force them to resign. Um, I, you know, I, I, I really think we need to be far more assertive in defending uh, democracy in this country than we are right now. Uh, Dr. Horn, and maybe this sort of kicks off from what Dr. Sinha just said. In your, in your review of Du Bois' book, Black Reconstruction, you know that one of the strengths of the book was his analysis, what you call the forces on the battlefield. How would you apply that analysis today, uh, given what, something we've just heard, what Dr. Sinha said, and what you've also talked about? Because um, I was really impressed with your the focus on that when you looked at the roles, and I'm wondering how you think about it. If he were around today, or you acting for, as his proxy today, what would you do along those lines? Well, with regard to the forces on the battlefield today, it's a mixed picture. Uh, we should take note of the fact that uh, in the South, from where I'm now sitting, the right wing routinely wins the Euro-American vote across class lines, oftentimes at ratios of nine to one in places like Mississippi, uh, eight to two in places like Texas, from where I'm now sitting. At the same time, and that's what I ended my remarks on, uh, there are hopeful signs in terms of some of the victories of organized labor. And particularly with regard to SAG-AFTRA, because, uh, you know, I wrote a book on Hollywood unions, and the last time they had a really major showdown with the studios, the leaders were red-baited into oblivion. Uh, Fran Drescher gave some rip-roaring class struggle orations, and uh, if there was any kind of red-baiting, I did not notice it. And so I think that that's a hopeful sign. And also with regard to the international situation, uh, I'm relatively optimistic, assuming we can avoid World War III. <laughs> that is to say, as I said in an interview the other day, uh, with regard to this crisis in historic Palestine, it will either ignite a, a dangerous movement uh, towards World War III and the destruction of humanity, or alternatively, it could help to ignite what is already in motion, uh, that is to say, a change in international order, the impending decline of the hegemony of US imperialism, the rise of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, South Africa. One of the problems there, to return to the negative side of the ledger, is one of the points I concentrated on in my remarks, and I 
concentrated quite a bit on in terms of writing and otherwise, is that since the Compromise of 1954, whereby there was an agonizing retreat from the more egregious aspects of Jim Crow in return for tossing overboard the most internationally minded leaders, speaking of Robeson, Du Bois, Shirley Graham, Du Bois, et cetera, the black leadership has been missing in action, with re generally speaking, uh, with regard to international questions, uh, which is uh, not only unsustainable, but uh, actually endangers us, us all. So if there was uh, an ability on my part to wave a magic wand, I would wave it and get the black leadership uh, across the board to engage more frontally uh, with regard to international questions, because otherwise it's a kind of magical thinking. What I mean by that is there's all of this uh, controversy and discussion in the black community about reparations for the depreda depredations of enslavement, depredations of Jim Crow. And yet the polls suggest that uh, significant percentages of the US populace are hostile to it, uh, which should not be surprising given the gutting of affirmative action, for example. And so obviously the only way to do an end run around that is the way we did an end run around that negative correlation of forces with regard to slavery. That is to say, you internationalize the question, you lengthen the battlefield. And uh, why that does not happen, at least not to the extent that it should thus far, is really a, a rather um, painful descriptor of some of the weaknesses of our leadership today. Thank you. Um, one other person that, uh, that you didn't mention is Robert Williams in Monroe, North Carolina, um, who had to flee to Cuba because of uh, standing up to whites. So we have some questions and I know, um, I'll, I'll, let me try to pick some from here and I'll address them to the appropriate speaker. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Senna, this I wondered about this. You got a question early on. What factors in, inhibited the success of anti-racist movements in the period 1865 to 1920? Um, and you've touched on some, but this person wants, I think, wants you to talk a little more about it. Uh, yeah, so I would say I would look at the period between 1877 uh, to 1920. Uh, my book really ends more in 1900. The only reason it's got 1920 there is because I talk about um, uh, the 19th Amendment as the last Reconstruction Amendment because it's modeled after the 15th Amendment. Um, I think the problem is uh, to really understand that this is a period of massive contestation. Um, you know, just because Reconstruction has fallen and, and reaction has won the day, um, it has triumphed both in the South and nationally, it doesn't mean that people are not contesting these. Uh, we think of the Knights of Labor at this time, we think of the spectacular strikes in, in, in Pullman, in Homestead, you think of Haymarket. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of strife, labor strife at this point. You think of the rise of the populist movement as a viable third party. Um, they're a real threat to the Jim Crow South. Again, you know, Southerners use a, a combination of racist terror and, um, you know, uh, voter suppression that disfranchises not just Black people, but also poor whites in many instances um, to, to create that solid South, that conservative uh, Bourbon democratic rule in the South that acts as a force of reaction, even in Congress, uh, going against uh, women's suffrage, going against uh, laws protecting labor, either ours, minimum, you know, ours, wages, or any other kinds of protections. So this kind of reactionary racist block in the South, you know, really manages to, um, you know, stop many of um, progressive um, uh, um, laws being passed. And they are able to, with the help of Northern capital, I should say, um, create this era of, of political reaction. But again, it's not as if that's not contested. You have the labor movement, you have the populist movement, and you have the socialists. 
Now, I th this is my theory. I teach a course called The Radical Tradition in American History, which got me in the watch list of some conservative groups um, for, for trying to indoctrinate students. Uh, but it's really a very mainstream course that begins with Tom Paine and ends with... Um, uh, with modern um, liberation movements. Um, so in that, you know, you, if you look at the history of the American Socialist Party at that time, um, under Eugene Debs, they are fairly successful. They're poised to become a viable party the way socialist parties become viable in Europe. But with the start of the First World War, they refused to go along on th this jingoistic nationalist platform uh, in a, which was really a nationalist imperialist war against, or as one of my teachers at Columbia used to call it, the tribal wars of Europe. You know, they refused to go along with their country in the First World War, uh, and they suffer a massive repression because of that. Now, European socialist parties all give up their international internationalist principles in solidarity with workers across nations and, and go along with their countries, and they survive as political forces. It's like one of those tragedies in, in US history. Um, but you know, this is an old question, you know, why is there no socialism in the United States? Why is the left so so weak in the US? And a lot of it, of course, has to do with these periodic repressive red scares and then the Cold War after the, the Second World War. Um, but I do think it's not as a progressive movements have not existed and have not won victories. They have. As I said, I've always seen this as more as contestation than the complete triumph of, of reaction and the complete defeat of radicalism. I think that's really important that both of you are making that point because it is easy to, and I know among my, many of my comments at DSA sometimes feels easy to feel really depressed. Um, so in several questions that I've seen in the chat and also in the discussion leading up to putting this session on, people have raised something, something like the following. I'll try to phrase it the way that I think captures several of the questions coming in. Is, is the rubric of defending democracy, defending the constitution, is that a good framework for us today to fight the rise of fascism? I'm addressing this to both of you because I'm interested in both of your thoughts. Is that a good framework for which to wage our fights today? It's, it's not an explicitly socialist framework, obviously. Um, it appeals to certain strains in America's, in many Americans' belief system. Um, but people have really asked that question, again, in preparation for this and a couple of questions in the chat. So I don't care who goes first, but uh, Dr. Orn, you want to go first on this? Well, once again, I would give a mixed response. Uh, I think in the review I did of Black Reconstruction, I quoted Du Bois talking about how it's virtually idiotic and letting the dead hand of the past rule to rely upon an 18th century constitution with all of its imperfections to seek to govern us today, particularly given the balance of forces domestically, which I just made reference to. On the other hand, given that very same balance of forces and given the fact that the right wing, per the mega MAGA speaker of the house, Michael Johnson, is bent and determined on rewriting this constitution to make it worse, I think that that is an impetus and that is a rationale for using that slogan, defending democracy, as long as we put meat on those bones to suggest that what we mean by that is not having an untrammeled right to carry weapons per the second amendment, but what we mean by that, for example, is protection of voting rights. It means that uh, we should not allow as is happening today, students for justice in Palestine being shut down as they are, which is now taking place uh, as we speak. Uh, that is to say, and basing that upon our own particular interpretation of the constitution. So once again, to conclude, I, I would say it, it, it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, on the one hand, you have this antiquated constitution. On the other hand, uh, there are those uh, who would like to make it even worse. Dr. Zena? Yeah, I agree with, with Gerald here. I, I do think that uh, it's not a question of 
you know, just sticking to the constitution as it was as it was written in the early, late 18th century. And I don't think the so-called founders intended that either. We need to think of a living constitution. We need to think of the ways in which we can rewrite the constitution, remake it as it was done during Reconstruction, or even use some of, of its very basic protections uh, today. For instance, the Second Amendment, uh, the Heller decision of the Supreme Court and the NRA have completely misinterpreted the Second Amendment, as many constitutional scholars will argue, right? Um, regulation uh, for bearing arms was part of the Second Amendment. They don't seem to read that part of the Second Amendment that doesn't really suit them. Or you have somebody like Trump say, you know, I'm going to overturn national birthright citizenship with an executive order. I think defending democracy is still a good slogan because in this country, only a minority of a minority votes. Just think about that. We make voting so difficult in this country. And in the South, they have in invented schemes to prevent voting since the end of the Civil War, since the 15th Amendment enfranchise uh, Black men and the Reconstruction Acts enfranchise uh, Black men. They, they just made it into a high art. Um, of of disfranchising people. And, and sometimes it's not just Black people, it's their political opponents, young people, uh, as you all know now, all these um, uh, machinations and legal chicanery. So it's, you know, it sounds like a simple thing, but with the rise of the right wing and authoritarianism and neo-fascism, again, all around the world, including in this country, I think um, we on the left should really figure out who our enemies are. Uh, and instead of, um, I think uh, we need to build alliances, including with liberals whom we may not agree with on many things. Um, we need the popular front of the 1930s. That's when the left was most successful in the United States, when they were able to build large alliances. Uh, we cannot, um, argue ourselves into irrelevance. Um, we have to be able to, to reach as broad an alliance against authoritarianism in this country um, as possible. And then we can think about moving the pendulum further to the left. Uh, once you have political power, you can think about introducing policies, thinking about uh, addressing uh, entrenched inequality, uh, moving towards a, a social democratic model that many Western European countries have already moved towards. So I, I do think that that we in the left need to not give up on that um, as seeing it as completely tainted, because as I said, um, these things are, you know, we are not a uh, biblical literalists or strict constructionists the way uh, reactionaries and conservatives are. We can use many of these ideas and many of these institutions, uh, including the law uh, and the constitution um, to, to better ends. So I, I would say, yeah, defending democracy brings a huge uh, alliance along with us. And I think we sh that's what we should bring with us. Thank you. So we have a question from the another question from the audience, which I'm going to have to read this one because it's a little complex, and then decide who wants to answer. Uh, this is from Carl Davidson. What stands do the labor surge in the North have toward the overthrow of Reconstruction? That's the first part of the question. Some Southern white labor scalawags were part of Reconstruction. What held Northern labor back from defending them? And I'll let you two decide if you want to both take a shot at this question or who wants to lead off. Is it, that's, I, that's, that's the literal question. I, I think it's sort of clear. Professor Sonner should lead off since she's just written a book on reconstruction. Okay, so uh, thank you. Um, uh, you know, Northern labor had a complicated relationship with the abolition movement even before the Civil War. Um, and I talk a little bit about this in my book, The Slaves Cause, A History of Abolition. But unlike previous historians who saw a real um, divide uh, between abolitionists, whom they dismiss as bourgeois by simply ignoring the Black presence in it, uh, especially that of former slaves, fugitive slaves, uh, and the labor movement, I saw a lot of commonality and a lot of overlap in what I call the abolitionist international, whether it was with the Chartist movement in Britain or with labor movements and land reform movements within the United States. Now, after the Civil War, you can see this persisting. Um, unfortunately, um, 
Many times, um, labor organizations like the National Labor Union under William Silvers um, tended to be very sympathetic to Southern white elites, not, not Southern white unionists. You would think, you know, who were poor whites, non-slaveholding whites, you know, laboring whites who joined the Republican coalition during Reconstruction. Uh, it led Black people to form their own uh, labor organizations. Uh, it was really unfortunate also that um, the trade unions uh, discriminated by skill, gender, and race. It's not really until the emergence of the CIO. There are a few AFL unions early on that are a little different, but it's not really until the emergence of the CIA or, or even the international workers of the world, the I, IW, industrial workers of the world, the IWW, that you get industry-wide, you know, people trying to transcend racial barriers. Uh, the labor movement could, for instance, in the West Coast be, you know, populated by Sinophobes against uh, Chinese uh, immigrants. So there was a lot of prejudice within the movement, but there are moments in, 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 in the history of labor at that time, both in the North, West and in the South, where they transcend them. One moment is the rise of the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor are quite amazing because they include women in the end and also black people. Uh, their tensions within the movement um, they 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 seek to address it, but they're not. It's not as if moments of cooperation are not there. They are there, and in fact, we know, of course, that employers and capitalists played the divide and rule game all the time when it comes to strike breakers, um, you know, trying to dismantle unions. Uh, so they use ethnic, religious, racial, all kinds of gender divisions against the labor movement. So the labor movement really succeeds. Uh, in the nation as a whole, when it is least racist and least um, susceptible to that divide and rule great game that that employers play pay. So, you know, you could have great thinkers like Henry George, who was concerned about poverty and inequality, but again, who was a Sinophobe, who saw Chinese labor as, quote, slave labor as competing against them. Um, on the other hand, you have instances of uh, interracial labor strikes uh, that are successful, uh, even in the deep South in some places. So we really need to look at all those instances and understand um, why racism becomes kind of an Achilles heel. Um, and in the post reconstruction period, many progressives throughout the nation um, tend to be very sort of dismissive towards reconstruction and the achievements of reconstruction. And that is a problem because they cannot bring African-Americans along with them unless they understand what was at stake during reconstruction and why its overthrow was such a tragedy for the entire nation, but especially uh, for the working classes in this country. Dr. Orne, do you want to add? Um, we have a question also directed to you. Oh, I'll, I'll take the question directed to me. Okay, let me get it here. Um, so uh, it says, Dr. Horn, your work on the American Revolution has been criticized by American Trotskyists who offer a defense of the American Revolution as part of the left's intellectual heritage. What do you, what would you say about these criticisms? Well, it, it, their, their beef is not with me. It, it's with the Negroes who in the 18th century, uh, by several orders of magnitude, sided with the Redcoats as they did in the War of 1812, for example. In fact, uh, I have a hypothesis that one of the reasons why Black people continue to carry these British names is in part a sort of homage to London as much as it, it is carrying over names from enslavers. I would also say it's not just me, as I was at pains to do during my remarks. Uh, there is a rewriting of the history of the United States taking place as we speak. As I said, Black Hawk is stressing the land question and stressing the Paxton boys and stressing how uh, even before those iconic years of 1774 and 1775, there were these attacks on British officials, which I guess uh, some of our friends would call pre-revolutionary attacks. I mentioned Winnie Houghton, um, Tyler Stovall, Robert Parkinson, uh, and, and as I said, Alex Barupi, whose, whose book will uh, go into more detail about how uh, the funding of this uh, 
revolt against British rule was largely funded uh, by enslaving uh, from in Latin America, from Cuba down to Argentina. I, I think that what happens, and it often happens, is that people uh, cling to what they learned in school, or they cling to what they learned in political education class. That's why I was very careful to cite the analogy of the biology teacher who doesn't want to deal with the uncovering of DNA for whatever reason. Uh, folks need to learn, and I would say this particularly to those who consider themselves to be part of the Marxist or socialist tradition, uh, that we have oftentimes told that it's not a, a catechism. It, it's it's uh, just like there's a living constitution, uh, there is a living body of revolutionary ideology. And to try to freeze frame it in the 1930s, because that was the last time that there was a significant upsurge, I guess all these scholars who are working today who are coming up with new discoveries and revelations should probably retire <laughs> if people were not going to pay attention uh, to what they're doing because they're so wedded uh, to the past. Thank you. Um, we're, we're pretty much near the end. I want to uh, maybe ask each of the two panelists to send like a two minute, whatever you would like to say for the last two minutes, and then we will um, wrap this up um, in reverse order. Dr. Warren, you get to go first this time. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I, I appreciate it. Uh, second of all, um, with intentionality, I, I cited these other works of the scholars, and films, because I, I do think that there is quite a bit to learn from what these scholars have been working on, including uh, Professor Senna's work that she's just articulated. And uh, I would point uh, your audience in that direction because as I also indicated in my remarks, this is a very dangerous, perilous moment that we're now facing. And uh, I think that when you face such a dangerous, perilous moment, it is time perhaps to revisit what had been thought to be bedrock ideas. We may find that those ideas are actually misleading. Otherwise, perhaps we not, would not be faced with such a dangerous moment, but once again, I'll leave it there and pass the microphone. Dr. Senna? Yeah, thank you, Bill, uh, for having me and the DSA for, for conducting this program. And I was really, uh, as I said, it was my honor to share this stage with uh, Gerald Kwan, whose books I have read ever since I was a graduate student and always learned uh, a lot from. And um, I would just end by um, addressing an, a, a, a question from an anonymous attendee uh, about uh, whether the U.S. is such a settler colonial project that we need to, um, in fact, jettison uh, all our founding ideas, including the U.S. Constitution, uh, which is, of course, uh, a very old constitution, right, uh, written in the 18th century um, and containing all kinds of compromises uh, over slavery. And, you know, um, it's true, you know, we live in, you know, we have land acknowledgments now, as Dr. Horn uh, pointed out, uh, we live in, in stolen land uh, in a country made wealthy through stolen bodies. And um, we have a long history of, of imperialism also, uh, which was part of um, the heyday of imperialism led by the British. Uh, you know, the sun never set in the British Empire, they used to say that because God didn't trust the British in the dark, uh, Indians would reply. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I do think that we are at that point in our history where we should be able to talk about what Tyre Miles has called the settler colonial slavery complex, and I would call also the, the long afterlives of imperialism throughout the globe. Um, and understanding very clearly that uh, if you're talking about dismantling this whole thing, you're talking about a stage of revolution that I don't think we are at. And I don't think that is the uh, probably the politically the wisest way to go, because uh, in fact, some people tried it in the late 19th century. And 
they they hardly did anything as as it always happens uh mainly violence against property rather than people and they felt the heavy hand the repressive powers of the state uh that pretty much like squashed their movement um so i i do think we have to work within the political framework that we live in today while being mindful of the long afterlives and legacies of slavery, of imperialism in this country. I don't think that um, in the United States in particular, and I speak as an immigrant, um, you know, who grew up in the global South uh, in a former colony of, of uh, the British empire. Um, but, you know, I, in independent India, then came to this country. I don't think that um, there is any one simple theory that defines these countries. Um, you know, it's uh, it's what we make of it today and what traditions we choose to use and how we deploy them today in our fight for social justice, uh, in our fight for equity. Um, so, you know, um, uh, Gerald mentioned many union successes that we've had recently. Those are not minor things. I think we need to dwell on that. The moment we get the idea that everything is tainted and defined by one thing that is the polar opposite of the kind of exceptionalist, liberal, mythic histories of the United States, uh, we are in a, in a zero-sum game. Uh, I think both as historians and as activists, we should be careful to understand how contested democracy has been in the United States uh, and figure out which side you're on. You know, the old union slogan, which side are you on? Uh, and fight for that side. Um, you know, when the January 6th happened, many people said, this is not who we are. And others said, this is exactly who we are. And I was like on a show on Democracy Now! And I said, both are wrong because this has always been contested. There's always been two sides. Uh, to this game in the United States. And it's the reason why you and I are here today and you and I are still invested in the history, in the scholarship and in the activism. Uh, and I would encourage people to view it in that way. Thank you both very much. What a, a really great session. And, and to answer a really question about, yes, it is recorded. So for people who, who registered and couldn't make it, there will be a way to get, access it. Um, and also, to the audience, we will send you out an evaluation questionnaire that we have yet to create, but we will. And just remind people that NPEC has ongoing events. The next one is going to be up sometime in the first part of December. It will be about uh, Palestine and Israel. So again, thank everybody for attending and uh, go off and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.